Throughout my life, I've always taken risks and felt a certain satisfaction when I've been in a difficult spot and made it through another day of challenges. There's a deep sense of satisfaction knowing that I've captured images that will make people aware of the way other people live and the things that they endure every day of their lives. My first major assignment in 1980 was a story on Balochistan, a tribal region in the southern part of Pakistan. There was a lot of skepticism as to whether I could or could not gain entry uh, into this region because it was closed to foreigners. I disguised myself as a local, but I still got arrested. My guide and I ended up spending four days in a jail, two of them in leg irons chained to a pillar. We weren't fed. We had to bribe the guards to bring us tea and stale bread and cookies. But after five days and four nights, we were released. And surprisingly, I wasn't deported. I just went back to work photographing uh, for another six months. A similar incident happened when I was photographing near a shop in Beirut in 1982, which unfortunately turned out to be directly under an office of the secret police. We were confronted by a man pointing a revolver at my driver's head and ordering us both upstairs to their office. Fortunately, I had some accreditation papers on me from several of the militias active in the city. And the driver and I were released after being searched and having my film confiscated. In 1989, I was in one of the most beautiful parts of Slovenia, which is Lake Bled, in February in the middle of winter. Uh, the pilot took the plane dangerously close to the surface of the water, so close that I thought, you know, we could be shooting pictures from this position from a boat. I said, go up, go up. But the wheels got caught and we went into the lake. My last memory as we were going into the lake was that the propeller shattered into a million pieces as we hit the water. Then the plane flipped upside down. It was an open cockpit and I suddenly found myself underwater uh, the fuselage began to sink, and I was upside down. My seatbelt was buckled, and I had this enormous helmet on my head. But an instinct for self-preservation kicked in, and I was able to wrestle free. The pilot and I swam under the aircraft to the surface. My camera and bag are still down in the bottom of that lake. Another near drowning happened in Mumbai, or Bombay, when I was photographing the last night of the festival of Ganesh, where statues of this elephant deity are taken into the sea at Chalpati Beach and allowed to drift away into the sea. I was uh, in the water up to my chest, taking pictures of some devotees bringing these enormous statues into the water when some drunken revelers tried to pull me underwater. They were shouting and punching me and hitting me. My translator was begging them to let me go and tried to intervene, but by that time, my cameras were all wet, ruined, uh, but I was only able to salvage the last roll that was in the camera. All the cameras, all the lenses were lost. I was on assignment photographing the Sahel. It's that band of land going from Senegal to Sudan that separates the Sahara from the grasslands. We were flying from Timbuktu back to the capital of Bamako. We left in a sandstorm and started flying along the Niger River, but the pilot's navigational instruments weren't working. <laughs> I watched him circling, and I started to wonder what the hell was going on. We came out of the clouds, and it was getting dark. There was a huge thunderstorm right in our path. The pilot dropped down even lower to a lower altitude, and I could sense that he was not going back to the capital but he was looking for a place to land the aircraft. To the south, an enormous black wall of clouds was looming on the horizon, a monsoon storm. In vain for half an hour, we scanned the landscape searching for an opening. We had no radio contact, no navigational equipment. We prepared our last thoughts. I mean, I literally thought I was gonna die in this small plane. Finally, the pilot spotted a mill field off in the distance, agonizingly small, but flat. As we thundered into land, I watched the wheel of the plane miss a six-foot hole by just steps. And then villagers ran out from the surrounding bush in wonderment as the sky started to pour rain. We slept on the plane that night, 
and finally found a vehicle to take us back to the capital, Bamako, a 14-hour bone-rattling ride. I've always felt extremely lucky that none of these situations escalated to more than they did. I am grateful for the trustworthy people I have met during my journeys. I am always reassured that there are plenty of good people in the world, despite the bad ones I have come in contact with.